Thank you very much. It's a really privilege for me to be here today in the uh, wonderful town of Vasselt. Uh, and, and it is an extraordinary place. I want to thank the committee for uh, bringing out the sun for 10 minutes yesterday. <laughs> that was a, a, a great thrill. It's also a privilege for me to be first on the program today because it takes the stress away from the audience. Because if you miss anything, the following speakers will tell you, uh, explain everything that I meant to say in the first place. So I, I'm here to you, speaking to you under false pretenses, because if you've read the uh, introductions, uh, uh, I'm supposedly an engineer, and I'm really yesterday's expert. I haven't really been able to uh, do uh, hands-on engineering for years, so I've uh, taken on a new profession. I call myself a historical futurist. And this is a risk-free profession, because the history that I talk about is 30 or 40 years ago, and most of the people who could dispute what I say are gone. <laughs> and the future that I talk about is generations to come. There's nobody that will hold me accountable, because none of us will be there. Perfectly safe uh, profession. But I want to talk to you about uh, a revolution, a revolution that my colleagues uh, and I at Motorola started 40 years ago, 40 years ago, uh, which is just about the same time as this university was founded. We started a revolution, jump-started a, a, a revolution that was based upon one very simple principle, and that is that people are mobile. They are naturally, inherently, fundamentally mobile. And you see that even on the streets of Hasselt. Everybody is rushing off somewhere. Nobody is where they want to be. Everybody is going somewhere else. And yet, for over 100 years, we were told by the phone company that in order to communicate with people at a distance, that we have to have a wire connecting them. A wire that trapped us in our homes that tied us to our desks, that kept us from being free. And then, sometime in the late uh, 1960s, the phone company, which in our country was AT&T, every country had a monopoly uh, at that time, uh, told us they had invented a new technology. They called it cellular technology, and this was going to set us free. And of course, we were very intrigued by this until they told us that their version of cellular telephony was car telephones, automobile telephones. So here for 100 years, we've been trapped in our homes, tied up uh, in our offices. Now we're going to be trapped in our cars. We didn't believe that. We believed that the time was ready then to have personal communications, the freedom that allows you to be anywhere and to communicate uh, at any time. So we decided to take on the uh, monopoly, to take on the Bell system, and to persuade our government that the frequencies that are required, the radio channels, would be allocated only for personal communications and that there would be competition. And just around the beginning of 1970, 1972, we realized that our government hadn't made up their mind yet. We had to do something really dazzling. And that's when I made the decision that we were going to show people the reality of the freedom of personal communications. And we produced a device that I'm going to show you now. And there it is. You can see how big uh, this phone is. Uh, remember now, this is 1973. Uh, we had no personal computers, no digital cameras, no internet. Can you imagine living without the uh, internet? This phone uh, weighed uh, over a kilo. The battery life was 20 minutes. <laughs> Wasn't a problem, you couldn't hold it up for 20 minutes. <laughs> And we took this phone first to New York, 
only to get publicity, to let the world know that this was possible, and then to Washington where we showed it to our politicians, uh, and after a struggle for a number of years, we won the battle. And, and in fact, the whole world has followed what the pattern that we talked about. It took some 10 years for this revolution to even begin. 1983 was when the first commercial service was. Uh, people think that cellular telephones happened immediately. Could you hold this for me, please? Maybe you could pass it around, let people feel how, just how heavy it is in case you didn't believe me. So uh, uh, it took some 10 years before we really understood that there were going to be millions of people. How do we know it's a revolution? There are six billion cellular telephones in the world today. I don't think there's ever been a technology uh, that has been so pervasive, that has so, had so many people involved. And then, about 10 years later, we heard that there was going to be a new revolution, digital technology. Well, I must tell you, I'm still waiting for that revolution to happen because our cell phones, and I use a cell phone. Is there anybody here that does not use a cell phone? Nobody. There's always one person in the audience who doesn't have a cell phone because they're trying to make a statement. <laughs> these, these phones are marvels of technology. They really are. But if you think of most of the things that modern cell phones do, they're convenient. They make your life a little easier. I would hardly call them revolutionary. I mean, reading your email uh, 15 minutes earlier than you, when you will be at a computer and you can sit down and read it in reasonable time is not, to me, a, a revolution. It's a convenience. Same thing you know, with uh, you know, the ability uh, to do navigation within the city. Uh, it, it, combining things in one device is useful but not revolutionary. What we are about, we have already started to be engaged in not one or two, but many revolutions. And I want to spend the next few minutes, next 11 minutes and 16 seconds, to, to tell you about a little bit about three of these uh, revolutions. Uh, and in fact, uh, some of the following speakers are going to go into much more depth uh, than I will. Uh, so I'll try to uh, be as brief as I can. And let me start with uh, uh, the revolution in um, uh, medicine. Now, we are uh, in a, approaching a crisis in medicine, and this is happening worldwide. Uh, we are spending huge amounts of money, a large percentage. In the U.S., it's 20% of our gross national product. For every dollar that we earn by working, by extracting uh, uh, natural resources, 20% of that dollar is going uh, into uh, medical care, and that number keeps going up. And if we don't do something different, it will reach 30%, and that's not sustainable. But the sad part about that is we're not doing a very good job, because what medicine does today is it tries to cure disease. Well, what if there was a way to prevent disease from happening in the first place? Well, it turns out, uh, my doctor friends have taught me, that every disease is actionably preventable. If there's anything that I've said today that you should remember is that one statement. If you look at the human body, and every one of your bodies, it's really a mess. I mean, you just are loaded with viruses, bacteria, toxins, and, and uh, all kinds of uh, ugly things, and yet you remain healthy because your immune system maintains your body in balance. When it gets out of balance, when somehow or other one of these bad things starts taking control, we define that as disease. Now suppose that you could put a sensor on your body that anticipated, that started to realize that something was happening that was getting out of balance and that allowed you, allowed science, allowed doctors to correct that in some way before it became a disease. Can you imagine having a, a disease-free society? That revolution is starting now. 
I don't want to uh, uh, raise too high expectations. A revolution that's important like that takes a generation or two generations or perhaps more. But it's starting to happen. There are already devices that are available, and you're going to see one of them uh, a little bit later that can measure things on your body that we thought uh, at one time uh, could only be measured by going uh, into a hospital. One of the things that started already is a thing called uh, compliance. Because we discovered that in the US, the fact that we prescribe medicine to people, we tell them, take this medicine for three weeks or for a month. They take it for one week, uh, and they feel better, so they stop taking it. And two weeks later, they're back in the hospital. And you know who pays for that hospital visit. We all do. And that's that one issue of figuring out how to get people to take their medicine. And there are many approaches using, you know, because you're dealing with people who are mobile, moving around. If you can approach these people and get them to take their medicine, there is a potential of saving a billion dollars a year. So and even though we're at the early stages, this is starting to happen now. Uh, the second revolution that I want to talk about is in uh, education. Uh, I am told by people who are expert at education that it's very difficult for a professor to give a lecture on a narrow subject nowadays. What's the difficulty? Well, every person here not only has a cell phone, but you've all got either a laptop uh, or an iPad or an Android pad. Uh, and you have access to all the knowledge in the world. There's no one professor that can keep up with that. We somehow or other have to accommodate the fact that the information is all available to all of us all the time. How much more efficient it would be if we could take advantage of this connectivity that I've been talking to you about and have people learning not just the few hours they can spend in school, but any free time that they had 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If we could take some of the billions of dollars of effort that we put into games and divert that into interesting ways of teaching people things, we will revolutionize the educational process. We're not going to eliminate teachers. There has to be a way that students can come to school to garner the wisdom of teachers, to learn how to use the tools, uh, and perhaps to even uh, 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 to be tested from time to time. So in the US, there are numerous experiments going on. And we call that the flipped classroom, the inverted classroom. We learn while we're mobile. We come to school to do the homework. That is going to be revolutionized. And, and the result of that revolution is that we are going to end up being a lot smarter than we were before. Because not only will we be learning more, we'll be taking advantage of the, uh, of the internet, of having all of this information, but we now have tools that never existed before. We will have computers within the lifetime of everybody in this room that have the processing power of the human brain. And if we can figure out how to interface with these computers more efficiently than we do today, and we are learning how to do that every day. Today, uh, our interface is the keyboard. That's a terrible way to talk to a computer. Uh, but uh, I just read uh, last week that uh, one of our manufacturers is, is putting out a gesture uh, interface. Uh, there are ways of having your brain directly control a computer. When we achieve that and train people in different ways, you know, we will have many, much more smarter population and much more ability to solve the problems of the world. So let me talk about what I think is the most important revolution that is going to happen within the next generation or two. What is the biggest problem that we have in the world today? Anybody want to take a stab at that? Do you, you have an idea? What, what, what do you think the biggest problem in the world is? Uh, I also followed your lecture. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it is poverty. 
It is a difference, sorry about that. It is the difference between the haves and the have-nots. If you look at what's going on uh, with the Arab Spring, uprising uh, in uh, China, terrorists uh, in Africa, if you think that has anything to do with religion or politics, you're wrong. It has to do with communications. You can no longer keep people uh, uh, poor in one area without them knowing what the rest of us have. And because of that, people want what they think they deserve. We have to solve that problem. There are only two ways to do that. The one is we can take the gross national product of the world and redistribute it. Let's take the, uh, a large proportion of what the haves had and give it to the have-nots. Well, that really solves the problem, right? Instead of having haves and have-nots, everybody will be poor. Not a solution. The solution is to improve productivity. Uh, and that is what is going to happen. How? This is going to sound silly to you, but social networking, the kinds of things that we now do as games. By the way, I forgot to tell you, my uh, Twitter handle is Marty Mobile. Everybody got that? And I expect to have a number of new followers by the way this gets done. <laughs> All these social networking tools right now are kind of sucking us in. They are training us. But what happens when we start using those social networking tools as part of our daily lives, as part of our decision-making processes, as part of the way we solve problems? Instead of having hierarchical systems where you have a decision-maker at the top and where you have highly structured and occasional meetings, you have people interacting on a continuing basis. That is going to be a bigger revolution than anything that I have said before. It's going to change all of our lives because it is going to make us not a little bit more productive, but infinitely more productive. All these things are going to happen. They are going to take generations. They are all being stimulated by the connection, the ability to connect us with the rest of the world. And when these things happen, I want all of you to remember that Marty told you first. Thank you very much.